I warmly welcome you all uh, in Heart of the Seminary. You are most welcome in our lunch talk today. Um, if you haven't had the chance yet, uh, please do look at the uh, uh, brochures and the information about the school, about the courses, about the programs, and the activities we scheduled for this year. You'll find them at the entrance um, of the school. I'm sure you'll find there some interesting programs and courses you might be interested in joining. And in case you needed any uh, information, you have any questions, my colleague Tina Demo would be glad to answer your questions about that. Um, when you read our brochures, you would uh, read again if you already know that we are very much um, interreligious, interfaith, dialogical place. We love the different opinion. We love the others. We embrace them. We hope to make our school a venue for dialogue, for different opinions about things, for uh, uh, enriching each other by our differences. Now allow me to introduce to you our speaker today. What does it mean to be a Christian in the birthplace of the three Abrahamic religions today? Who is a Palestinian Christian in identity and context? What does it mean to read the Christian Bible as a Middle Eastern text and in Palestinian eyes? How can the Arab-speaking Christians sail safely and survive through the troubled waters of a drastically turmoiled region like the Middle East today? How can one develop today a Palestinian Christian theology that stems from the very genuine social, religious, and political context of today's holy land? No one addresses these crucial questions and attempts at raising a theological voice, responding to them in the holy land today more openly and better than our guest. It gives me personally true pleasure to welcome among us today a colleague and a friend from my home region. Our guest today is Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahib. Dr. Rahib comes from a family that has lived in Bethlehem for hundreds of years. He did all his theological graduate and postgraduate studies in Germany, first in the Evangelical Lutheran Mission Seminary in Hermannsburg and then in Phillips University Marburg where he earned his doctorate in theology. Reverend Dr. Arahib is the founder and president of Diyar Consortium and of Da El Kalima University College in Bethlehem as well as he is the president of the Senate of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land and on top of all of that he is the senior pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, Palestine. The most widely published Palestinian theologian to date, Dr. Rahib is the author and editor of 16 books, including I Am a Palestinian Christian, Bethlehem Besieged, Sailing Through Troubled Waters, The Invention of History, and the Biblical Text in the Context of Occupation, just to mention a few. His books and numerous articles have been translated so far into 11 languages. Dr. Arahib's work has received wide media attention from major international media outlets and networks including CNN, ABC, CBS, 60 Minutes, BBC, The Economist, Newsweek, and Vanity Fair. And in 2011, Reverend Dr. Arahe was awarded in Germany the prestigious international award Deutsche Medienpreis, and the jury of the award stated the reason for granting it to Dr. Arahe in the following words. The decision to give the award to Reverend Dr. Arahe was based on his tireless work in creating room for hope for his people 
through founding and building institutions of excellence in education, culture, and health, and also due to his strong position and stance on culture of life and dialogue. Dr. Arahim is amongst us today to talk about his latest book, Faith in the Face of Empire, the Bible through Palestinian Eyes. And this book was published by this year by Orbis Books. We have copies of the book, as you can see, on the table there for sale. And Dr. Arahim will uh, be available to sign books after this talk. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Reverend Dr. Mitri Arahim. Thank you, Rob, um, you know, for this uh, introduction. And uh, I have to say, I mean, uh, Najib and I, our friendship goes many, many years back. And uh, I still remember uh, actually walking along in, in Lebanon, in Beirut, uh, along the Mediterranean, talking about all the theological projects uh, we were interested in. And, uh, uh, you know, these discussions, it's like, uh, you know, in the Bible, they would like go on and on and on uh, until the uh, early hours of the day. Um, and uh, it's also interesting to see how our roads were crossing from Hammond's road to Marburg to Hartford. Uh, so thank you. And it's really a pleasure to be here uh, at this seminary. Some of you might not know that back in 1996, actually, I spent here three, uh, three months uh, doing uh, postdoctoral uh, research. And so I feel here at home. I was, in fact, living here on the compound. So in that sense, it's like uh, coming back home. And it's, uh, it's really great to see some of our old friends, like Jim Smith and others here uh, from, from that time. Um, and when I think of Hartford, there are many actually good memories that, that comes to mind. I would like maybe to mention just two, because uh, uh, at that time, actually, there was uh, a big research project that Hartford Seminary and uh, our organization at that time, but then we were still very small. We didn't have a university college, but we did a three-year uh, actual research program on uh, theological education in Muslim countries, from Indonesia to Ghana to Palestine uh, and the UK. It was fascinating. Uh, and so that is one uh, fond memory I have. And the other one, it's, uh, I, I, can, I cannot forget that. Uh, you know, I was spending every day eight hours here in the library, researching and writing and reading. And one day while I was researching someone, from the Middle East, and a name popped up, uh, and I had really to, you know, to stop and to read it again, because it was a name I was very much familiar with. It was the name of my pre-precessor, the Lutheran pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, from 1896 to 1947. And he spent like half a century there. But I never ever knew, and I really know that part of the world really well, I never knew that my pre predecessor wrote a book in his life. And guess what? The book was not to be found in the Middle East, but I could find it only here in Hartford by chance. And so I was so excited. And it was, you know, in some of these back uh, rooms because no one would uh, like to read a book like that. And so I, I immediately was so excited, actually, to take this book and, and to read it. Um, and uh, actually, later, we discovered that the daughter of this pastor, a PK, uh, was actually the first female photographer in the entire Middle East. That is another book I have written about uh, about uh, his his daughter. So, lots of connection with Hartford, and uh, it's really great to be to be here. And thank you for 
arranging this, this wonderful gathering and for, of you to, for all of you to come here. What I would like actually to do uh, uh, this, uh, this morning is, or this noon is just to give you maybe a, a bit of a background uh, about, uh, about my latest book um, and then maybe for 15, uh, maximum 20 minutes and then to engage in a dialogue with you with, with all of this expertise in Rome and Rome and interesting people I would really like to, to, to engage in a dialogue. And uh, actually, uh, good news since yesterday, uh, on Amazon at least, uh, Faith in the Face of Empire uh, is described as number one bestseller in uh, uh, Christian liberation theology books. So that was uh, actually Somebody from back home wrote me and said, you know, did you see that? I said, no, I didn't. So, uh, so it's, it's great. I, I, I got this message this morning in my, in my hotel here in Hartford. So uh, maybe something about the background. Uh, as uh, Najib said, this is uh, my 16th book. And uh, I feel with the first 15th book, uh, books, uh, uh, I was dancing to the rhythm of 19th century European organ music. Nothing against organ music, I love it. But it was, you know, this European dance that I learned in Germany and that, you know, sticked with me for a quarter of a century. With this book, I feel finally I'm starting to discover the beat of the Palestinian drum, which is actually the main instrument in the Middle East, and uh, really to dance according to that theology. Uh, in that sense, it, for me, this is something very exciting. It's not like another book. I feel that slowly, after being brainwashed for a long time in Germany. Finally, I'm coming back home. Nothing against Germany. Please <laughs> not misunderstand me. I have here some German friends. But, but I feel really, um, you know, uh, it's now the first time that I'm trying to read the Bible really through Palestinian eyes. Uh, so something about the background. What really was bothering me for the last 10 years uh, was uh, a disconnect. Uh, the first disconnect I could see is that, you know, when uh, I was all the time moving between two groups of people. On the one hand, theologians, and on the other hand, political scientists. But you know, it's very difficult, actually, to keep moving between these two groups. Because when I'm with theologians, uh, history uh, is like this. It starts with Abraham. <coughs> okay, sometimes, you know, 2000 or something uh, BC. And then it ends more or less with the second Jewish revolt. 132, 135. That's where history ends for theologians. And then, when I'm among political scientists, our history begins with late 19th century, with the Zionist movement, and it goes for like 100 years. But there is somehow, no one really talks about the time between those two years, and no one would like to mess up connecting the two. It's very dangerous. But the problem is, as a Palestinian, the history of my country is a history that goes for at least these 3,000 years. And I, I have to see it as one history and not just to, you know, uh, disconnect it. This is theological history and this is now political history. And so I was struggling how can we actually bring those both groups and perspectives together. 
And this actually is the first thing that I in this book. And the other uh, problem I was uh, really struggling with is a kind of a bias in the, in the discipline, uh, in the theological uh, seminaries. There is a subtle bias against Palestinians. Not because people don't like Palestinians, but because the Judeo-Christian tradition was so emphasized in a way that actually led to a bias against us. And uh, thinking of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, actually, it's, uh, it's interesting, actually. I mean, that if it were a, a conflict between Israeli only and Palestinian only, we would have solved it long time ago. The problem is that this conflict is subsidized and supported by the international community. The international community is not part of the solution, they are part of the problem. For two reasons. One is the international community keep actually providing the hardware for Israel. All of these toys, you know. F-16 and submarines and this and that for free most of the time. But, and even more dangerous, theological seminaries have been providing the software for this hardware to work. Software meaning for the average person on the pew, when he hears, uh, when he on Sunday morning hears something about Israel, in the Bible, and then goes back home and watch TV on Fox News and they talk about Israel. Somehow, subconsciously, they, they connect the biblical Israel with today's Israel. And this actually helps people to assume that what's happening in the Holy Land is divine intervention. And believe me, uh, it's not these uh, Christian Zionists who do that. You know, we know that, so that's, that's not our problem. And it's not the average person in the pew, it's those most liberal theologians at Harvard and at Union that actually doing that in a very sophisticated way. But they are doing it all the time. They are providing the software. And so how can we crack this software? This was actually the question I was asking behind this book. And, and the third problem I could see is that um, uh, our story as Palestinian uh, was not part of the discussion. Uh, it has been silenced for a long time. Uh, you know, just yesterday, for example, I was invited to speak at the University of Boston at Boston University. And, uh, it's interesting. Uh, one of the Jewish professors made a big problem because I was invited. How can you invite this Palestinian? And you know, he was attacking me left and right because they don't want this story to be told. And you know, if you have a very weak person somewhere, you know, they just very quickly, you know, they don't want to have a headache. And so our story has been silenced in theological settings. This is what, what was bothering me. But, so that's, that's the background. But actually the good news on the other side was that in the last 30 years, theologically there has been lots of work going on that was giving me hope. Interestingly enough, it started with a Palestinian, Arab, Christian, Protestant. His name is Edward Said at Columbia University when he wrote his book on Orientalism, basically depicting this bias against the Arab Islamic world, which leads to a bias against Palestinians. He didn't work on theology, but on literature. Uh, but this was actually uh, the start of, of a very interesting development. But also in the last 15 years, there was lots of works done on empire studies that actually provided a very interesting background for research for me working on this book. 
uh, and uh, the whole area of post-colonial studies that has been going on now for a long time. Uh, that was very helpful. And the most maybe recent and most exciting project is a project that uh, ran out of Oslo in Norway called Jesus and Cultural Complexity. And they are uh, trying to de deconstruct lots of the assumptions that we have as theologians in terms of Israel, but also uh, beyond that. So actually, when, when I started doing more and more research, I discovered actually there are so many people, and there is so much research actually, that we can capitalize on, we can build on. And I tried actually to use this in the second chapter of my book. But what actually led to this book was something totally different. Um, Najib said, on top of things, he is the senior pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church. Actually, I'm mainly the pastor of Christmas Lutheran Church. All other things I'm doing in my free time. <laughs> and being a pastor means, you know, every Sunday I have to go to the pulpit. And in that context, in that setting of the Middle East, in that uh, in the middle of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I had to preach about biblical text to a Palestinian Arab congregation. And within the course of 25 years, I started actually seeing patterns that I see in our society today, but I could also depict these patterns also in the Bible. And so I started thinking, is there any connection between this? Um, and, and actually this led to, to, this, uh, to this discovery. In this book, I'm using actually a, a theory that was a historic theory that was developed in a French uh, a context uh, called long durée, which is looking at history not as uh, an event here and an event there, but looking at history through a long lens uh, where you can really see uh, major developments and patterns. And this is actually the, the lens I'm trying to use in this, in this book. Now, if you take this book, it's very interesting uh, because you will discover that actually one very important aspect of our history in Palestine and in the Middle East was and is that we have been living for almost all the time under imperial occupation. It started with the Assyrians, we know that as theologians, right, 722. Then came the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greek, then the Roman, and usually for theologian it ends there. <laughs> Correct? But actually, the history of our country continued. So, then the Byzantine, as empire, the Arabs, Crusaders, you can mention Ayubites, I will skip now a few, and Ottomans, British, and actually, we have here to add Israel. Now, I know many people, you know, they, they are not used to think of this because they connect the biblical Israel with today's Israel. But actually, I mean, political scientists, they put Israel today as part of European colonial history. Without the colonial history, there would be no state of Israel. I mean, just not, let us not kid ourselves. So actually, you have to put Israel in this line of empires. And if we do that, then basically, we have to put the Palestinians in relations to the Israelites of the Bible. Not necessarily genetically, but as people who are living and experiencing the heat of being occupied by the empire. So that's actually the thesis that I'm trying to develop. And if you look at it this way, you would suddenly come to discover that actually, if to understand the Bible fully maybe, we need to listen more closely to the Palestinian narrative. Because that Palestinian narrative 
has still something from this maybe original message of the Bible because what I'm trying to see in the book is that actually the whole Bible from Genesis 1 to uh, Revelation 22 is nothing but the response of the occupied people to the empire. And if we take the empire out, we cannot actually understand the Bible. And if we don't really know the whole dynamics that people who are occupied are facing on daily basis, we cannot actually know what are the questions that the, what the, the questions that uh, the, the people of Palestine and the Bible were struggling with. You know, that's actually. Uh, I still remember when, after finishing my studies in Germany and coming back, that was '87. You know, I came back uh, thinking that I have now all the answers. You know, I was the first pastor to finish his doctorate, and then in Germany, where Germans think you know they are doing theology while everyone else is doing contextual theology. <laughs> And so I came back really thinking, sorry for the Germans, but I, I like to teach them always. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, just, you know, after six months, the first intifada started, and I had to discover that people in Palestine were asking different questions. So they were not asking the questions to those answers. And so I had really to listen carefully to where people are. And um, to, to live under imperial rule uh, is really not easy because you have lots of, of, of existential questions that rise up. Questions like, God, where are you? That's a major question that runs throughout the Bible. Uh, and I, you know, I hear this question by so many Palestinians on daily basis. If they are accumulated at a checkpoint, I hear an old Palestinian woman, she knows nothing about theology. She never read the Bible. But that eternal question of God, where are you, is still being asked. And for me, actual revelation in the Bible was this. It's not that there is a God. That's boring. And it's not that, that there is only one God. That's also boring. But the discovery was to spot God where no one else was able to spot God. Because the gods of the empire are very visible. You go to Egypt and you see the pyramids. You see them. And you go to Iraq, at least if you went to Iraq before the destruction, you, know, you could see all of these you know, huge temples and walls. And, and so on. But if you come to Palestine, there isn't actually anything visible. There are no traces of this God. You have only traces of the empire. Every church, major church, every synagogue, major synagogue, every major mosque was built by the empire, not by the people of Palestine. It's interesting. And so this God of the people of Palestine is totally invisible. In fact, you don't see him. He seems to be not reacting. He seems to be not caring for his people. You know, his people are pushed to exile. He does nothing about that. He allows that. And his major city and capital where the temple is destroyed and burned down, he does nothing. You know, you have a Nakba 1948, doesn't move a finger. So where are you, God? That's the question. And I think the revelation, the discovery that our forefathers and foremothers did was to see God going in exile with his people. And when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple burned down, to see him there. And when our people went on Nakba 1948 and were chased out of the country, he took his luggage with him and went with them. 
And this is why it is just the climax of this to see God in no other place but on the cross. That is exactly the God of the people of Palestine. And this is why actually I chose this painting of the crucifixion done by one of the three top Palestinian artists, who by the way is a Muslim artist. And it's interesting, 2002 when Bethlehem was under siege for 40 days, 27, 24-7, uh, and we sent out a message to all of our teachers and students saying, let's use this time when we are closed in, in something constructive. We would like to have a competition about Christ in the Palestinian context. It's interesting, all the Muslim uh, artists, they sent us paintings of the crucified. In, in, in Hartford Seminary, you think, you know, this is somehow, you know, isn't this against Islamic theology? Not for a Palestinian. Because if you think of Palestine, if you think for a sample of our people, it's only the cross that tells our story, and tells our story best. And this is why I chose, actually, this, this painting by Nabil Anan, is his name, the artist, uh, to be on, on the book, because that's actually uh, our identity. But it's not the identity of the victim. And I would like to end, actually, my, my introduction there. Because imagine if our forefathers went out just whining about the empire crushing their lord. Maybe, I'm sure, they would have had some sympathy. Maybe as fundraising tool, this must have been good. But thanks God, they discovered, actually, that that message is not what Palestine can offer the world. What Palestine actually can offer the world is to go out and to, pro to proclaim the crucified risen. Because crucifixion is not only a Palestinian experience. This is a global experience. Thinking about the Ukraine now, what's happening there. They are in a similar position, surrounded by empires. Uh, thinking of Korea, thinking of many African countries, many Asian countries. You know, this is a message of universal value that came out of Palestine. And in that sense, I think our forefathers really, through the spirit, discovered that they have good news to share with the world. The good news that actually, out of this crucifixion, Palestine can offer the world hope and the culture of life that comes out of the most difficult context in the world. And believe me, if the Palestinians can offer the world hope, then there is no one who remains hopeless. Thank you.
personalities who are Arab and Christian. And then there is, of course, the whole uh, Eastern Christian heritage of which you and I are part. And I suggested that perhaps what we should do is have a, a program of dialogue with the West through our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East. That is to say, we and you dialogue with the Christian West. And then I heard, I'm sorry, I, mean, I will not give a lecture, I will be finished in a second. <laughs> then I heard uh, uh, in jest a suggestion, and the suggestion was to create a Palestinian uh, resistance movement, not called Hamas, but Haman. Haman, that means the uh, movement of Christians, Masihiyin. And I thought about it, and you know, Haman is also means dogs. And uh, the dog is what alighted on the uh, head of Jesus Christ to proclaim his divinity. And it was the dog that brought the, uh, also the uh, olive branch uh, to the Ark of Noah so that people could go out and worship God. Perhaps you should uh, establish Haman and eventually try to draw some Muslim members into Haman. Thank you and I appreciate what you are doing in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, there were some some experiments done to to create such a resistance movement. Uh, I, I think some some people called it even Haman. Um, I guess what what I'm interested in right now is is really to develop uh, a genuine Palestinian Middle Eastern narrative. Uh, that that is really. Uh, where, where I feel uh, in the next decade, I think this is where we need to, to put all of our energy. Because I feel so far we were always either responding to some Western development, say Christian Zionism, or post-Holocaust theology or something. So always responding, reacting, uh, or to be in dialogue. I mean, Yehizkiah and I have been in dialogue for many, many, many years, you know, and Christian Muslim dialogue and so on. But I feel it's, it's really now what's even more important is to develop a genuine narrative, because without genuine narrative, there cannot be any genuine dialogue. And we need our narrative first to be heard and to have a place on the table. And so this is where I feel really uh, all of the energy um, is going. But I guess developing a narrative is part of what I call creative resistance. Uh, I don't like the word nonviolent resistance because I think it's negating the negative, but it's, it's creative resistance. And for me, that's part of maybe of what we are doing. Thank you, and Professor. But that would be part, you know, what I'm suggesting would be also part of yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I mean, this is your story and our story. Exactly, exactly. I just wanted to use your words to see what I always wanted to see. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is Courtney Barnes. I'm curious uh, why the liberal theologians are resisting that narrative rather than helping uh, articulate it. Um, it's a very good question. I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but uh, I guess, uh, actually let me, let me read to you something uh, uh, from the book. Maybe that answers actually your question. We had a conference uh, in Bethlehem, 
uh, international conference, every year we have one. And this was on hermeneutics. And so uh, a US professor, Julia O'Brien, uh, she writes, uh, has identified four distinctive features that are characteristic of mainline Protestant hermeneutics. We don't talk now about the Catholics and the so Protestant, so that we criticize ourselves, basically. So she writes, for typical US mainline Protestants, an interpretation of a biblical text is convincing and compelling if they hear it as liberal, supporting universal human rights, especially for those whom they recognize as historically oppressed, and even more especially women. Scientific, objectively verified by the text itself, or even more by historians and archaeologists. Savvy, sufficiently skeptical of human bias. Supportive of Judaism and supported by Jewish leaders. That's part of hermeneutics. And then she's saying, she continues writing, an interpretation is problematic if they hear it as socially conservative, unconcerned with the improvement of this world, especially the status of women, fundamentalist, or overly biased, accepting biblical testimony at face value, ideological, promoting only one side of a conflict that they believe is multifaceted, challenging what Jews see about the Old Testament. <coughs> So basically what happens is that actually the overwhelming of Protestant theologians, they all the time do self-censoring. This is one. The other thing I think which she doesn't talk about, but often, I mean, I see this in Germany again, but in many other places, in the States as well. You know, unfortunately, with the Palestinian narrative, often, you cannot make a career. And I mean, just just publishing that book, I mean, you cannot imagine uh, how difficult it is. Because, you know, the many publishers are saying, you know, this will not sell. You know, no one is interested to hear the Palestinian narrative. Uh, it will not be a New York bestseller. <clears throat> not because it doesn't deserve to, but there are so, mechanisms, so many mechanisms in this country, actually, that silence this voice. And I think, you know, theologians are humans, so they would like to make careers. And there are some horses. You can actually make a career on them. The Palestinians, unfortunately, it's not one of them. Not yet. So with this book, I hope that we just open the way that people will start really, you know, to have the courage, you know, to move on uh, with, with different. So, so that would be, you know, uh, my answer. Hi, um, you mentioned that the Bible is best understood when you're under when you're looking at it through the lens um, of people living under an empire. Could you just elaborate on that for a minute? Maybe give a couple of examples of what you mean by that. Um, I mean, uh, really, I can go with you. And there is in one chapter I'm trying to show that, uh, but. Uh, But really, you know, the, the whole the whole notion of, of empire is, is evident in, in, in all of the books. Maybe just to give you uh, uh, to give you uh, maybe one example that I mentioned in the book. Uh, it's the story, for example, of the Tower to Babel. We all know it. Uh, actually, this is this. This, this topic talks about the empire because that tower is a symbol of the empire. And if you look at most of the empires who actually, uh, you know, controlled our region, uh, they wanted to have, you know, they have a, a military power, economic power, thinking they can reach heaven. But also they wanted always to unify the region under one if possible, one time, which, for example, the Greek, uh, or one Greek, like Constantine uh, uh, tried. Uh, 
and basically negating the identity of all the groups and nations and cultures that have been there. And actually, this led all the time to suppressing those identities. And actually, the story of uh, uh, Babel is a critique on the empire, that actually all empires that tried to do it this way, they ended up in confusion. It didn't work. While the Bible, for example, offers a different, uh, a different image uh, in the story of Pentecost. Now, in Pentecost, the whole empire was there, but not as, as empire, but as all of these identities. You know, they, they mentioned them, including Arabs. Okay, all of these identities are in Jerusalem in the year 33. Each one heard them speaking in their own language. So it's not one language, that of the empire, but it's the languages of all of these groups that were articulated. And there was no confusion, but exactly the opposite. There was communication. And I think this is actually talking about the Middle East. That is exactly for me the vision that actually the New Testament were providing for not the new Middle East of Condoleezza Rice. This is the biblical new Middle East where all these identities have their own space to develop their identity, to articulate their narrative, and yet without leading to uh, confusion or to contradictions, but uh, it's a diverse Middle East. It's, it's unity and diversity. And I think this is exactly uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, what the Bible is offering as uh, as maybe a solution. And I think this is why in the New Testament the, the kingdom of God actually is basically what replaces the empire. This is why, I mean, Jesus' main message was about the kingdom of God. We cannot understand the kingdom of God if we don't understand the empire. Because that's the alternative to the empire. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but this is what. Greetings, my name is Ian Mungian, and I was very interested by this um, use of the symbol of the crucifixion as a kind of a unifying symbol for Palestinians, both Muslim and Christian. And you mentioned that Palestinians often ask, where is God? And it's in the crucifixion, the one time we actually hear Jesus ask the very same question. So keeping with this uh, motif, what would a resurrected Palestine look like? What would be the characteristics of a resurrected Palestine? Uh, a good question. What uh, uh, in, in the book I'm talking about uh, many things. What that means? Let me mention one. Uh, otherwise, we'll not buy the book. So, I to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the notion, you know more than a victim. Uh, and what I'm really saying there is, and that's for me the, res the importance of the resurrection, is, is really uh, as occupied people, we should not feel too comfortable in the shoes of the victim. And this is always my message to Israel, because sometimes I feel Jewish people, they, they, uh, they always like uh, uh, almost as if they have monopoly over victimhood. And then you have some Palestinians who want to compete with, with the Jewish people about who is the biggest victim. I think this is very destructive. Uh, because for me, the resurrection means uh, we are more than victims. And which means uh, we are accountable. Because if you feel only as victim, it means you are not accountable. You don't want to be accountable. And so you allow yourself to do this and that because you know you are victim. This is unfortunately what, what Israel has been doing. Because they were victimized by Europeans, they say, you know, we can allow ourselves to do everything. I think this is destructive. And so for me, resurrection for the Palestinians, we should not fall into that trap. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am Lean and I'm a master student here. I watch uh, some of you like just a year ago and you stated some beautiful and powerful quotes about what Palestinians really need and what uh, what roles religions would play in, in, in the current context. 
grounding from the from the examples of Jesus in, in the time of occupation at that time. And my question would be, what would be the proper uh, relationship between religion and politics in your theology? Thank you. I mean, this is a very interesting question, we need like a uh, full semester <laughs> so really to talk about it. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure uh, how best now in, 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 few, in few words to, 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 to answer it, but let me you know, say this because I, I write about that in the book. Uh, if you live in the Middle East, uh, I feel we have uh, too much religion and too much politics. We have so much politics. Uh, uh, the problem is that all of this politics is totally disconnected from the polis, from the city, from the people. I mean, imagine uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, in her capacity as Secretary of State came 28 times to the Holy Land, to make what? Peace, right? I mean, if she would work for us at our center, we would have fired her a long time ago. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a waste of time. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean seriously, it's not that she's a bad person, but I mean, uh, uh, look at uh, John Kerry, you know, how many times he's going there. I mean, diplomacy shattered. The thing is, people hear about all of these, you know, Peace talks, but they see no peace. And I think Jesus exactly actually uh, knew how to choose his words when he said, Blessed are the peace makers, not the peace talkers. <laughs> so in the Middle East, we have too, man, too much peace talks, peace talking, uh, too many processes without peace. So that's on the one hand. And again, the, the, the ordinary person on the street, his life is not touched by all of this shattered diplomacy. Not at all. And I think politicians have really to, 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 to reflect on that. On the other hand, I feel in the Middle East we have too much religion. We have so much religion, and I always say that God himself is saying, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot handle that much religion. <laughs> Now imagine if God himself cannot handle that much religion, how we must feel. Because with, with all of this religion, you know, the region is, 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 uh, is losing its soul. And I think this is, should make us as, as pastors and as religious leaders, you know, cry. I mean, how come with all of this religiosity, we are actually losing ourselves? And so that's not the answer about the relationship, but for me, that's my starting point. So basically, we have to redefine what, what politics means and connect that to the polis. And we have to redefine what religion means. And so for me, as a pastor, I always you know, uh, tell our people, which is interesting, you know, I, I don't see my role as pastor to make sure that we have more religion. I see my, my role as a pastor to work for less religion. Because less religion might means more faith. And I think we are losing our faith with all of this religiosity that is just sweeping <coughs> our nations, you know, I mean, the whole Middle East, Israel, Palestine, everywhere. So that would be for me the starting point. Uh, and if you see it like that, actually, you cannot separate both because at the end of the day, both have to be in service of the people. But that does not mean that we should not separate religion and state. We have a research project on the relationship between religion and state in the Middle East. That's, an, that's another, another totally different question. I have one more inquiry here, and I would allow one more if we have short answers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know.
this resurrection of Palestine, if that makes sense, as distinguishing the people from the Israeli yeah, thank you. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's always important to distinguish between um, the, 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 the system of uh, the matrix of control, if you want, and, and the people. I think that's important. But regarding the Jewish narrative, in fact, uh, this approach, I, I, I would say the good thing with this approach is that uh, for me, uh, the Jewish narrative becomes part of my story. Because uh, that wasn't always the case. Because uh, you know, usually we, we would look at uh, at, uh, at at uh, uh, at Judaism as being something totally separate, you know, not connected to us, say, Palestinian or Palestinian Christian. But if you look at this this way, uh, you will see actually that the Israelites of the Bible are actually part of our story and history. Uh, and uh, they are part of our narrative, uh, including, you know, also, uh, you know, the, 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 the other, uh, like, more recent uh, development within Judaism. But uh, you wouldn't accept uh, the state of Israel as, as part of, that's not part of our story. So there is there a distinguished that is really very important. Um, uh, uh, and I think we really need to, uh, you know, as Jewish theologians, to talk more about what that means. Uh, uh, I think it opens new ways of doing, uh, of doing dialogue, uh, uh, incorporating this as part of our, uh, of our history and narrative. Um, because, I think what's really important in this book, sorry, just to, to add this, uh, which is uh, I'm bringing the whole issue of identity, because I think this was missing in the whole dialogue. Identity meaning, uh, uh, if I look at the history of my family, their identity keeps changing based on imperial rule. So my name, for example, Mitri is not Lutheran and definitely not Arabic. Uh, but it's, Arabic. it's Arabized. Yeah. It's an Arabized name. Uh, and my grand, my great grandfather's name is Constantine. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, even my name has the traces of this empire that came to our region and basically uh, uh, oppressed all other Christian expressions in the region and because they wanted to Hellenize them, to make them Greek Orthodox. And so, but today my identity is different. So I have those traces, but you know, it keeps developing. Today I see myself as an Arab, as a Palestinian. I mean, this wasn't like all the time we were seeing ourselves as Palestinian. Uh, in 19th century, if you go to Istanbul, people in Bethlehem did a mother of pearl piece that is now in the museum there, and it says Bethlehem Ephrata. They are using the biblical name. So it's not Bethlehem Palestine, it's not Bethlehem Israel, it's Bethlehem Ephrata. So they were using all of this you know, biblical name. So that was part of their identity, but identity keeps keep, keep changing. And this is why I think in, in future dialogue, we should not undermine the importance of identity. The good thing, what I'm writing in the book, is that our identity is still open-ended. I love the word in the first uh, letter of John where he says, we know who we are now, but it's not yet revealed who we are to be. So that's great, you know. I mean, even Israeli and Palestinians who are not yet stuck with our current identity. Maybe in 50 years down the road, there will be a new identity emerging. Uh, and we have to be part in creating this new identity. So we are not stuck. That's the good thing. The last question, Steve. Thank you for your message today. And thank you, Saeed, for mentioning you like uh, dialogue and differences of opinion. 
But um, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask you as a Christian Zionist, uh, I think the three things that motivate uh, the Christian Zionists are the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, the countless promises in the Bible regarding the return, with God himself returning the Jews to the land specific, uh, as well as the literal return of the resurrected Jesus. And I want to ask you on those three points, do you believe in those literal uh, statements from the Bible that Jesus was resurrected physically, his people, the Jews will be returned to the land, literally, and Jesus Christ is coming back, literally, in his physical resurrected body. That's what, like I said, seems to motivate the Christian Zionists. But yes, yes, no, yes, I'll answer those three questions. Uh, so is this now a, a, a test to make sure I'm kosher or not? <laughs> more complicated than yes or no, because I think as theologian, if we just answer yes or no, uh, we are not uh, getting to the real point. Uh, what does that mean? That Jesus was right. Yes. Uh, you know, I think, uh, 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 I think theologically is, uh, what do we do with this resurrection? And how is this resurrecting, uh, resurrection affecting us? I think that's really the question. It's, it's not a, just an issue of, of yes or no, but it's it's what is that doing to me, and that, what does that mean to me and to us? I think that's that's where we really need you know to have the dialogue. Uh, uh, I personally don't believe you know and that you know yet the, the Jews. <coughs> Will, will return. No, I, I don't. I don't read the Bible this way. Uh, because I think we are missing the point. Uh, 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 the whole point. Because for me, uh, prophecy uh, was never about the future. It was always about the present. Always. It's about the choices you have to make today. That's what the prophets were interested in. They weren't interested in speculation. So speculation is for me not part of, uh, of, of, of faith, actually. It's, it's part of, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually part of an ideology. Uh, and so I, I, I would definitely say no to that. Uh, and the question is, I think, uh, who is returning? You know, and, and that's for me the, the main issue. You know, just to end up maybe with a story I'm telling in the book, uh, an old American lady, very nice lady, uh, uh, once uh, came visited us and said, you know, uh, she was really genuinely interested, and she said, you know, I, I don't understand the Israeli because God told them in the Old Testament to be nice to the stranger. I said, thank you, but the question is, who is the stranger? Yeah. I don't see myself being the stranger. I have no problem to be nice to the Jewish immigrants who came to Palestine. This is the way I read it. But I not, don't read it that I'm suddenly the alien at home. And they, they are coming back. You know what I mean? And the question is, uh, so I read this more as, as people in exile struggling with, with where is their home. And I tell you, if you read Palestinian poetry of today, they resemble exactly those Jewish texts because the story continues. And so the question is, will those people be allowed to come home? Will they believe that actually uh, uh, even if the empire take them away from their homeland, that actually God wants them to be back? 
That's exactly the struggle that the text is having. And if, if you listen to the Palestinian today living in the exile and they cannot come back because the empire is not allowing that, you will read this text with totally new eyes. And so this is why actually I encourage you to read the book because you might find there another. Jesus coming back. Thank you, Mitri, for a very stimulating talk and very inviting book. And uh, thank you also for all those who ask questions. You made the talk lively and Stimulate. Thank you very much indeed. Please feel free to have your copies of the book and Mitri will be available there to talk with him further, to ask him anything and to sign with us. Thank you very much for coming over today. Have a good day.